Good evening and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you are in the know. Um, you can find us online at commonwealthclub.org, on Facebook and Twitter, and at the club's YouTube channel. I'm Mary Cranston. I'm a past chair of the Commonwealth Club. Um, I'm a, a retired senior partner and, and former chair of the Pillsbury Winthrop Shaw Pittman Law Firm, and I am your moderator tonight. Today we're going to focus on an issue that has been very hot in the press, raised consistently by presidential candidates and voters alike, and that is income inequality. A recent Pew poll found that a substantial majority of Americans, 65%, say the economic system in this country unfairly favors powerful interests. And if you break it down, that's 82% of liberal Democrats and 50% of Republicans say the system favors the powerful. A 2013 Federal Reserve report said that the top 10% of families in the U.S. received about half of the total income distributed in the country. And it's argued by many that the American dream is vanishing and that the cause is rising income inequality. So are tax hikes and raising the minimum wage solutions to saving the American dream? Or do they embody what free market advocates like to call a war on success? And today we're going to have a very spirited discussion on these topics. Um, and uh, we'll be talking about the best uh, approaches to nurturing uh, individual success. So we're very fortunate to have our guests uh, on my uh, uh, right over here, Dr. Yaron Brook, uh, who is the executive director of the Ayn Rand Institute and a co-author of the new book, Equal is Unfair, America's Misguided Fight Against Income Inequality. And Dr. Alan. Auerbach, Professor of Economics and Law and Director of the Birch Center for Tax Policy and Public Finance at the University of California in Berkeley. Dr. Brooke was born and raised in Israel. He served as a first sergeant in the Israeli military intelligence uh, and then uh, he earned a degree in civil engineering from the Technion Israel Institute of Technology. In 1987, he moved to the United States where he received his MBA and PhD in finance from the University of Texas. He became an American citizen in 2003. For seven years, he was an award-winning finance professor at Santa Clara University. And then in 1998, he co-founded BH Equity Research, a private equity and hedge fund of which he is the managing director and chairman. And Dr. Auerbach previously taught at Harvard and the University of Pennsylvania, where he also served as the economics department chair. He was deputy chief of staff of the U.S. Joint Committee on Taxation in 1992 and has been a consultant to several government agencies and institutions in the United States and abroad. He holds a PhD from Harvard. So please join me in welcoming our two distinguished guests, Dr. Brooke and Dr. Auerbach. So I, I know we're going to have a, a very interesting debate because our, our two authors have slightly divergent views on this. And so I'm just going to start with some opening questions where they can kind of lay out their basic perspective. So Dr. Brooke, let's start with you. Mm -hmm. You say income inequality doesn't threaten the American dream or the American way of life. In fact, you say the real threat to America is government intervention to correct inequality. And could you please explain your position? Sure. Uh, let me start by thanking the Commonwealth Club. I mean, this is a fantastic organization. And thank you for putting on events like this. And and uh, inviting this kind of debate uh, in, uh, in San Francisco. The problem, America faces many problems. The American dream indeed is under threat. There are problems of poverty and, and lack of mobility among the poor. The ability to rise up, I think, is being hampered. There's real problems in the middle class. Economic growth in the United States today is way too low to really build a healthy, prosperous, successful middle class. And at the top, there is no question that there are problems of pressure groups, of cronyism, of people who reach economic success not through innovation and their own success, their building of real wealth, but through their connections to the government, through manipulating the system, through playing the political game, the political game ultimately of coercion. But none of those problems, none of those threats have anything to do with the gap between the rich and the poor, or the gap between the middle class and the wealthy. None of those issues are issues of inequality. 
So inequality is a diversion. It's a diversion from the real issues. And as I will argue, and I think we'll have an opportunity to get into this in more detail, I strongly believe that the reason all of these problems exist, the reason that, uh, that the American dream is under threat, the reason that we're seeing less mobility and, and the middle class and an economy that's not growing, the reason that cronyism exists is because we've seen a dramatic growth in government intervention in our lives, in our economy. Uh, we've seen a unlimited government, a, a shift from what was a limited government to today what is an unlimited government in terms of its involvement in our lives, in our econ economic lives, but in really in every aspect of our lives. That is holding down the poor, that is suppressing their ability to rise, it is holding back our economy from growing as fast as it could grow, and it creates the environment in which cronyism thrives. When you give people power, over other people's lives, people will lobby to try to manipulate that power, to try to change that power. The solution to cronyism is getting the government out of people's lives, minimizing the power of government, giving f less and less reason for people to lobby, to try to manipulate, to try to influence. Uh, so there are problems in America. None of them have to do with gaps. None of them have to do with the phenomena. And I'll make one last point, and that is that Americans historically have never resented wealth. They've actually admired it and wanted to be the neighbor across the street with a bigger house or the bigger car. Uh, we've always aspired to be successful. And I think that this whole, uh, this whole attack on inequality is meant to destroy that, to destroy that, you know, that American spirit of ambition, uh, of wanting to be successful. Instead, we're teaching people to be resentful to be envious and to resent the success of their neighbor instead of to strive to be as successful as one's neighbor. Well, thank you. You've raised some very interesting points that we'll want to get into in more detail. But let me turn to Dr. Auerbach first and say uh, and ask you um, to kind of lay out your perspective. You have said that you do believe that some regulation is excessive, um, but you find the position against intervention to address income inequality unconvincing. So from your perspective, why is government intervention necessary and what happens with that without it? Well, first of all, I'd like to just point out that inequality has been growing in the United States by any number of measures, whether one is looking at wealth concentrations, distribution of income. In fact, if one looks at life expectancy, there's been an increasing uh, inequality in outcomes in the United States. Now, it, I don't think it's due primarily to government. I think government has neither uh, made it worse nor made it better in the last several decades during which this has happened. But it is a, consider a, a concern uh, for us as citizens, and it should be a concern of the government. Because the idea that inequality per se is not bad if everybody has a shot and that a rising tide lifts all boats works only if people really believe that's true. And it helps for it to be true for if, if we want people to believe it's true. And one of the things that's happened as inequality has risen, uh, I agree, it's not so much the problem of inequality, but as inequality has risen, there's been very little growth in incomes for people below the top of the income distribution. And this, along with various social problems that have accompanied the slow growth of income, have made people very unhappy. And if we just think about it in terms of the political outcomes, not, uh, leaving moral issues aside, whether it's fair or appropriate for this kind of inequality to exist, just think about it in terms of political outcomes. If we want to adopt policies that are good for the country as a whole, we have to have people buy into those uh, uh, approaches. For example, economists are fond of favoring free trade over trade protection. And we're currently having a debate in this country where there's a lot of sentiment against free trade. Well, why is that? Because trade may help the country as a whole, but it, it generates winners and losers. And if people look at the possibility of a freer trade and see themselves as losing from the outcome, they're not going to support it. So if we want to adopt policies that may be in the national interest, but may also make inequality worse, we have to accompany these policies with measures to address inequality. Dr. Albert, your views on that? 
Well, I mean, Dr. Yarn. I think I think this kind of boils down to the to the essential way of looking at the world. There's a certain implicit assumption, certain collectivist view, uh, the national interest. I don't, I don't know what the national interest is. I know what my interest is. I know what individuals' interest is. Uh, there is a there is a sense in which there's there's a national pie out there, and and we need to figure out the best way to divvy up this national pie. There is no national pie. There's my pie. There's your pie. There's your pie. And it, what, what, as economists, we can do is we can aggregate those pies on a, on a spreadsheet, but that doesn't make it our pie. It doesn't make it our problem. And once we accept the idea of a collective pie, then now we've got trade-offs, right? Um, trade is good for these people. Trade is bad for these people. So we, we need to figure out, and at the end of the day, the people with the most political voice, the most political power, the people who pound on the table loudest, are going to get their way. You're seeing this right now with the discussion in California. The discussion has ended really in California about the minimum wage, right? Clearly they are victims as a consequence of raising the minimum wage. Even, even Governor Brown has admitted that it will increase unemployment among teenagers. But they are victors as well. They are people who are gonna earn more money, right? And they're certainly political victors. And now we're trading these things off. So I'm against this whole notion of viewing the world as, as a group pie that we are now going to trade off interests against one another versus a much more limited role for government, which is to protect our lives and leave us free to choose the trade-offs, to choose what to engage in, what, what job to take, what job not to take, what business to start, what business not to start, who to buy from, who not to buy from, who to trade from, who not to trade from. Even the issue of trade, America doesn't trade with China. I trade with China, Walmart trades with China, I don't trade with China, I trade with a Chinese person. Walmart tra trades with a Chinese company. Who cares, right? If it's America, China, individuals are trading. Let individuals choose. You don't want to trade with China? Stop buying at Walmart. Stop buying things that say made in China. So these are individual choices rather than collective choices rather than collectivizing these decisions which make them political. I'd like to see these, these decisions excluded from the realm of politics. You know, one of the things that you... Can uh, I, can I just, uh, sure, uh, absolutely, go ahead. Uh, you've made my point for me. My point was that if we want to have policies where government does not interfere in markets, for example, by not having very large protective tariffs, we have to have a political environment that lets that happen. And the only way we can do that is if we have a consensus. You talk about the lack of there's no collective uh, entity. Well, there is. It's called the voting population. And we have to have a majority of the voting population approve of these policies. I personally favor these policies, but I also understand that if people do not benefit from it directly, they're not going to favor it. There are a lot of people out there on both sides of the political spectrum right now who are very much against free trade because they see themselves as losers from it. They want more government intervention. Th they favor policies which you're against. And the only way that we can avoid having such policies is to have some sort of a safety net so that people who are adversely affected by these policies understand that they will nevertheless uh, have an opportunity to succeed in society. You know, Dr. Brooke, one thing uh, that your book has uh, made, uh, a point you've made over and over is that um, success is, in, in your view, based on effort much more than luck. And that's, that's the appropriate perspective uh, to have in a, in a political system and in a, in a uh, government system. Um, but what would you say about uh, systemic biases that are just intrinsic in human beings? And a lot of them have been documented now. There's gender bias, there's racial bias. Uh, things that, that make the playing field so inherently unequal if you're just relying on individual effort. And is there a role for government in those kinds of uh, inequalities? No, and, and I, I think the, the, the role is of education, just like I think the same issue is with regard to, let's say, trade. The solution is not to choose different winners and losers and to reshuffle the deck. The solution is to educate people about the benefits of trade, the benefits of freedom, which is really what we're about, about individual freedom, and the benefits of having the government not intervene because... People are going to be losers when they do. And this, and this relates to the bias question, too. Yes, people are biased. It, it's a reality. There are, there are racists out there. There are people who bias people against uh, gender and so on. 
the solution to that is not reverse bias, which just institutionalizes the bias and it makes the bias legally acceptable and therefore makes racism or whatever the bias happens to be legally acceptable. The solution is to educate, to make it unacceptable, to boycott, to p provide social pressure, and to teach. To, you know, so this is the, the, the role of the intellectual, the role of the educator in my world is a, is a, is a key function. Uh, people ask me, you know, what about these cognitive biases? We, you know, we're not rational actors in economics. Yeah, it's, it's good to learn about these cognitive biases so we can fix them, so we can become more rational, so we can make better decisions. That's the role of unveiling these biases so that we can become better at not being biased. Dr. Erbach, what would be your perspective on, on the, well, I, these I, kinds of issues and I, the fairness I, of the system? I think that I, I would concur that one shouldn't always look to government for solutions and that markets, I mean, this goes back to Milton Friedman's uh, classic book, Capitalism and Democracy, arguing that markets uh, can help overcome these kinds of problems, in write, the writings of Gary Becker and others, talking about discrimination. Sometimes markets help. You know, if, if somebody who's being discriminated, discriminated against uh, is eager for customers and willing to sell for a lower price, then a lot of people will overcome their biases and buy from that vendor. And that's sort of the way the argument goes. And sometimes that helps, and sometimes that's not enough. And again, getting back to the issues of both f fairness and what's moral, as well as sim simple pol uh, need for political consensus, sometimes government needs to get involved. I concur that government involvement is, is a, a dangerous medicine, and sometimes there can be excessive government involvement. It can lo lead to lobbying and special interest groups getting payoffs, all true. That means that we should be careful how we use the instrument, not that we shouldn't use it at all. But, but it, it's very dangerous when we have government starting to decide, or majorities in a sense, starting to decide what's fair, not what, and then legislating it. And, th and this, is, this is what I mean by unlimited government. When government can now interfere in more and more of our lives, based on, yeah, a democratic process, but based on what the majority inflicts on the minority, I mean, I think thankfully we have a Bill of Rights because I wonder right now what would happen to free speech in America if people actually voted on free speech. I have a feeling it would disappear and we couldn't even have the debate. Um, so I, I'd like to see government shrink and eliminate and, and us to educate people about their own rational self-interest in their own freedom and liberty rather than have votes on what's fair and what's equitable and what's biased and what's not biased and what's a religious freedom, or what's a secular freedom and all these issues, which, uh, you know, uh, at, at the end of the day are, are destructive to the American dream and the American spirit and what this country is really about. But sometimes government's needed to foster the American dream. I mean, think of antitrust uh, laws and regulations. We have those to make markets work better not to interfere with markets. Now, they don't always work. It's, very hard, it's a very hard instrument to apply. But I don't think, going back to the period before 1900 with the trusts and having individual industries con controlled by single companies is going to improve market outcomes. I, it, it'll, it'll stifle opportunity. And, and uh, I think it's generally been very helpful to have this sort of thing, which is not to say that we should have excessive regulation. We've had periods of deregulation, which were good. But having government not involved at all in some of these cases is not necessarily going to foster, the, to, to promote the cause of freedom. And, and to follow up on that, there's a, a question here about, uh, to Dr. Brooke about how, um, you started out by saying we do have problems in America sure. and uh, there are, uh, entrenched cronyism and government regulation that are causing a lot of problems. How do you get to your pure position? And uh, can you get there without the political compromises that seem inherent in our system and government intervention to take care of some of the more obvious cronyism problems? So luckily I'm not a politician. So I don't have to <laughs> compromise and, and I'm not going to. Um, <laughs> Look, you, you can't, this is going to take time. I, I don't have, I, I'm not under the illusion that tomorrow or in the next decade or two decades, uh, everybody's going to embrace my ideas. The way to change politics is ultimately you have to change the people. People have to change their minds. I agree that this is, this is the political process. But they have to have, a, they have to have something they believe in, something as an alternative to We'll use government and uh, maybe we overreach sometimes, maybe we underreach sometimes. 
I just would like to see government out of the economy for good. And, and I disagree about antitrust. I, I actually don't view, looking back at the 19th century, uh, the trusts were as damaging as, uh, as, the, uh, as the writers at the time made them out to be. There was a, clearly a political agenda around that. Uh, one wonders what the world would be like if, J if, uh, if uh, Rockefeller hadn't had the economies of scale to make kerosene and then gasoline as cheap as it did. The world might be a completely different place if that particular so-called monopoly had not existed. Uh, so, so I question, e I, I, would, I would even question the existence of antitrust. I, I, think, I think it's a bad law. I think it inhibits, uh, it inhibits innovation. I think it's been shown in the case of IBM and Microsoft to destroy good companies and to move them in a, in a very negative direction. Um, so it, politically, and what I'm suggesting, feasible, of course not. There's not a political candidate on the map that comes anywhere close to this. But unless we define a goal, unless we define an ideal, the right, right, always drifts leftwards because the left has no problem defining an ideal and never has had. You know, look at Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders is, is, is maybe the most leftist candidate ever in America. And he's doing very, very well because for years they've been leftist candidates who've been willing to push the envelope on the left. So they've said, okay, we'll compromise on Obamacare, but what we really want, what we really want is 100% is socialized medicine. Nobody on the right, nobody, not a single candidate on the right said, what we really want is 100% private medicine. And that, by the way, includes no Medicare, because Medicare is, is, is huge, right? If you're really consistent on, on private health care, nobody on the right said that. So. Of course you drift leftwards because that's where the goalpost is. There's no goalpost on the right. The right is, is, is starts out the conversation by saying, we'll compromise. We just want to compromise a little to the right and not to the left. I want to set the goalpost. Complete 100% private health care for America. Now let's negotiate, if I was a politician, right? Nope. Yeah. <laughs> nobody, nobody on the right said they wanted that kind of health care because they know that the health care markets don't work very well. And they know, <laughs> and they know that that kind of uh, having, you know, having that kind of situation leads to the situation, the, the con condition that we had, which was a very large number of people with pre-existing conditions who had no access to health care, very inefficient outcomes. And Republicans and Democrats, at least at one point, understood this, including Mitt Romney, uh, before he uh, decided he was against his own proposal. The, you know, the. Um, Health, healthcare is a perfect example of a market that there are certain benefits, that, major benefits that we get by having markets, uh, private markets in healthcare, but there are also serious problems uh, in, of market failure, very, really first order problems of market failure that exist in the healthcare situation, which is why no country, including the United States, even before Obamacare, had a purely private health care system. It wasn't because of a lack of will on the right. It was because, it was because of an under, a common understanding that this is a market that doesn't work very well, it left entirely to market forces. But, you know, so we're going to disagree on this because uh, I have no question, no, no, no question in my mind that free markets would work in health care. Uh, and many economists have held this uh, on the right, granted. Uh, but... What we take, and this happens over and over again when we talk about uh, uh, free markets, is we take the status quo as this is free markets and it's not working and therefore we need to fix it. There were no free markets in healthcare before Obama, you're right. There haven't been free markets in healthcare since World War II. And as a consequence of all that government intervention, primarily in the insurance market, which has distorted the healthcare market, as a consequence of that, these markets have failed. The failure was the regulation. The failure was the regulation of the insurance markets. If that had not existed, there's no theoretical or practical reason healthcare markets cannot work efficiently. Well, Dr. Harbert, can we go back actually to the true. basic <laughs> question of fairness? Because yeah. I think uh, Dr. Brook uh, takes the view in his book that uh, there is no unfairness to income inequality. It's the natural consequence of different levels of effort. Um, what is your perspective on income inequality and as it relates to the fairness question? And in your view, what causes the income inequality that we see today? I think the causes mm -hmm. of income equality relate to whether one should think of it as fair or unfair. I, I agree that inequality per se is not something that we should necessarily view as pernicious or something to be attacked. Uh, it certainly is more disturbing if it comes about because of uh, 
activities that are amount to basically theft or, or uh, things like that. I think you would call that cronyism, but it could happen without government involvement. And uh, there certainly is a perception, I think it's largely wrong, but there, there is a perception today by many people that the gains mostly occurring at the top over the last few decades have been in some ways illegitimate. I, I say I don't believe that, but that uh, mm -hmm. means I don't think it's necessarily unfair, but it is, it is a serious problem nonetheless. It would perhaps be an even bigger problem if, or I would think it was a bigger problem if it had come about through, uh, you know, through illicit means. But, but it's, so whether one thinks about it as unfair or just uh, unfortunate, it is something that we have to deal with. We just have to deal with it as a society. The, the, you know, otherwise, we're going to have politics like we have right now, which is very, very extreme candidates proposing unrealistic measures that would make things worse because people are grasping for solutions be, uh, to, a, to a situation that they find unacceptable. You know, Dr. Burke, one question I would have for you is uh, you do have a, a clear and I would say a pure view of how life would be better. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you sort of wonder how you can you can get there. You, we, you talked about it a little bit earlier, but uh, we do have this very polarized country. We have a lot of different perspectives. How would we ever get everybody on board to take out all the regulation? We have so many winners and losers in the existing system. It, it cannot be done unless there are fundamental changes in the way Americans think about the world. I mean, I, I'm, I'm under no illusion that we could cut some kind of deal and, and, and start moving the country in my direction. And again, I believe the right has lost every significant battle about government intervention since probably 1913, since the Woodrow Wilson administration. I can't remember a victory that the right has had other than deregulation during the um, Carter administration and then under Reagan. There's almost been no victories on the right because I think the right has not staked out a position. So they were, against, uh, they were against the New Deal and they folded. They were against the Great Society and they folded. They were against everything that the Democrats put in, that the left put in, and they folded on it and, and, and loaded up on it, like Part D of Medicare under George Bush. They doubled up on it. They, they grew it, or Sarbanes-Oxley under Bush, you know, bigger regulatory state with no, real, with no z huge costs. Um, so I think the way to move the country in that direction is to question fundamental beliefs. And again, I think part of that is this notion that today we see both on the Trump campaign and on the Sanders campaign and on the Clinton campaign is, is a general uh, view of collectivism, both right and left. Uh, I was horrified, for example, when uh, McCain came out of the Republican National Convention eight years ago with the slogan, country first. Now, to me, country first is a fascist slogan. <laughs> America's not fascist. America's not about country first. America's about, in its original intent, about the individual first, individual rights. The government is there to serve us. It's our servant. It's there to protect us. It's there to eliminate uh, wealth that is created by fraud. Certainly, the inequality, if you want to call it that, created by Bernie Madoff shouldn't have been allowed to occur, right? He, should, he went to jail as a consequence and probably should have been caught a lot, lot earlier than he was. So that's the job of the government. That's what the government is there to do. It's to protect us. And until Americans are willing to accept that much more limited role of government, and, and this goes back, I mean, this goes to a much more fundamental issue, which is a moral issue, right? That the, that the center of morality, the, the, the focal point of morality is not the collective good, it's not the good of others, it's not society's well-being, the common good, the public interest, all these terms which in my view mean very little other than the pressure group politics that are behind them. And at the end of the day, this country was founded on a new vision of the good for the individual and that the good for the individual fundamentally is to be left alone, is to be free, free to pursue his happiness in the way he chooses to pursue it. And sometimes that leads to great wealth, and sometimes it doesn't. But it's not the government's or society's job to then come in and, and rejigger that. <laughs> Dr. Auerbach, what would you be your perspective on how a change in attitude along these lines would actually, would it be possible, and would it have the effect that uh, Dr. Brooke is saying it would? Oh, now you're asking for a <laughs> you're that asking for a suspension of disbelief. 
Look, I spend most of my time since I live in Berkeley <laughs> defending the U.S. market system. And <laughs> I, so I have a lot of sympathy for his, his position because I think markets generally do work better than most people understand. And I think in many cases, government attempts to intervene in markets make things worse. But I also think, and I spend a lot of my time teaching about the circumstances in which markets don't work well and which government, government intervention appropriately designed can make things better for the market participants. And I also think that you need a, you're not going to educate people to be against their own self-interest. And if they understand that markets functioning well, perhaps with assistance from the government when they don't, are going to leave them with very little no matter how hard they work, they're not going to support it. And you can educate them day and night and write more books, and they're going to feel the same way as they do right now, which is very unhappy. So Dr. let me Rick. just quickly, uh, first, life is not just about money, and that's part of what we need to educate people. It's not just about money. Freedom is far more valuable than money. Um, but let me, uh, uh, going back to the, the improbability of this, the, the, the science fiction of it, if you were sitting in 1650 uh, in any place in Europe, and somebody had said, you know, one day, in less than 150 years, there's going to be a, found, a country founded on these new ideas that are coming out of the Netherlands about individual rights and the Diedorf and all these other philosophers are talking about that John Locke would formulate, and there'd be a country based on that system. They would have thought you were nuts. And that, by the way, and there would be a separation of church and state. This is in the middle of the Catholic slaughtering the Protestants and vice versa. People would have thought you were crazy. So I, yes, there's never been a country exactly like the way I would like it to be. There was never an America before there was an America. But what shapes history, what shapes the world, ultimately are ideas, are philosophies. And it, while I don't expect to see big movement in the direction that I would like it to go in my lifetime, I do believe that good ideas win out in the long term. The long term is the long term. It, it takes a long time. I'm, I'm, I'm very realistic about my prospects for short-term success. Well, let me ask you this one. <laughs> Can you think of an example today of a market failure that you would concede requires government intervention? No, I mean, I, because I don't, I don't concede the term market failure. Um, it, it, almost every time you point me in the direction of a market failure, uh, I see uh, government controls and government regulations behind them or, or corruption in some way or fraud. And fraud we know is wrong. Fraud, there's, two th there's a thousand years of common law. We, we understand that. Um, certainly, there, there, are, there are violations of property rights that are new that come about that government has to intervene, pollution being one of them, uh, intellectual property rights. We didn't know really intellectual property rights existed. It, you know, it's a relatively modern phenomenon, how we apply it. So I'm not an anarchist. I, I believe government is necessary. Government is necessary to define and then protect property rights, and the application onto property rights can be, you know, is, is something that, that evolves and changes because the world evolves and changes. We discover new things. Um, but, but no, I mean, every time people point me to, I don't know, financial crisis or, the, or, or, or Rockefeller in the 1860s, 70s, I see either good things like in Rockefeller or, yeah, I, everything about this financial crisis, I see government all over it. Now, did, was they greed on Wall Street? Yes, but there's greed on Wall Street every single day of the year. It's their job. Their job is to make money. And uh, you create the right incentives, they do their job well. You create the wrong incentives, they do a horrible job. And, and that's what happened in 2008, among other things. I've gotten so, a, a, a bunch of questions on um, upward mobility and the impact yeah. of in income inequality on mobility in our culture. Uh, uh, Dr. Abar, why don't we start with you? Um, what would you say are the facts about uh, upward mobility in the last 10 years in America, and what has been the, uh, co the co uh, contribution of income inequality, and what would be the fix? The evidence on income, in in income mobility in the United States is it has not really changed that much. You have to look over long periods, because over short periods we have recessions, we have other things that, that distort uh, what the picture we get. But if you look over decades, as inequality has increased, there really hasn't been much of a change in mobility, number one. Number two, the U.S. 
is often held out as a very mobile society. And that is certainly true if you look at certain groups, such as recent immigrants. But overall, if you look at the U.S. compared to other Western countries, the U.S. does not stand out as being a more mobile society. And Dr. Brook? I mean, I, I, I think empirically that's right. I, I, I don't disagree with that, although I, I think America was more mobile uh, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, and I think that, that we've lost a lot of that, and it's unfortunate, both on the way down and on the way up. Um, but I think that what's important here are that there are policies, in my view, that, that clearly hold people back that we institute in order to correct inequality. And, and I think the minimum wage is, is a classic example of that. W in the name of helping the bottom rise up, we're creating a whole subgroup, and everybody admits this, it's one of the trade-offs, a subgroup of teenagers, particularly inner city teenagers, who will never have a job. And if you never have that first job, because you just don't produce 15 bucks an hour, you're just not producing, or 10 bucks, or whatever the rate is, if you never have the first job, it's hard to get a second job, and you're never going to get a third job, and you, you can't rise up. So in a sense, m many of these policies are instituting a certain group into that poverty. Or take licensing laws. They're, 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 they're ridiculous licensing laws in California where you need license to shampoo hair. Now, that doesn't, it's not going to hurt my kids, right? But there are poor kids out there who would like to get a job shampooing hair and, and, and use that again as a stepping stone. They, they need a license, which costs, I don't know, a thousand bucks to take a course and to do this thing. Or to open a nail salon, you need a whole slew of government licenses, which cost, again, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. This is a young, typically immigrant entrepreneur who's trying to start a business and improve their life and rise up. And in the name of protecting a monopoly, right, the, the people who already have the jobs, we, we, we're, we're excluding them and we use the excuse protecting the customer. We've got so many of these laws and regulations, and ultimately, I would even argue the welfare state itself discourages mobility. It encourages people to stay put, to become entitled, to, to, to have an entitled mentality, rather than to, have, rather to exercise real ambition and, and, to, and to raise themselves up. Dr. Arbat, if you could, uh, if you could ad address that topic also and, and talk a little bit, if you would, about uh, ideas you might have for increasing the mobility from the bottom sure. part of our culture. Well, first of all, let me agree that there are po government policies such as uh, excessive licensing, which are aimed to protect incumbents and in industries, which I don't, as an economist, don't, don't favor either. Um, th the fact that there are bad government policies doesn't mean government policy is bad. There, are, it, I agree with you that it's hard to get things to work. You know, you're, you're, taking, you're taking a risk when you turn uh, a responsibility over to government because there are going to be interests that uh, lead to the kinds of, of situations that we have. But, and I would also agree that a $15 minimum wage in California that applies even in very low wage areas with high rates of unemployment is, is probably not a good idea. And I think, frankly, that's the consensus of the economics profession. Uh, the economics profession is more split about some minimum wages in some places, but having a very high minimum wage in a very low wage area is, is something that w actually would get very little support among economists, in part because they see better policies, not no policy as an alternative. And there are other policies. And some of these policies, such as the earned income tax credit, which is a very important policy for addressing uh, both uh, disincentives people have to work, as well as uh, poverty, I think are, are very successful. So I, th I think policies like that, policies promoting education uh, among people who uh, don't have access to capital markets or opportunities to borrow adequately to, to become educated, are, are important ways of addressing uh, mobility and addressing poverty. And it, simply saying, citing certain government policies that are counterproductive as proof that government policies don't and can't work, I think is, is in, in incorrect. Uh, Dr. Burke, um, one of your points in your book is that um, the notion of uh, equal opportunity is, uh, false, uh, is a false premise from your perspective. And I think some of the policies you're talking about would be attempting to equal the opportunity playing field out there. Um, could you talk a little bit about why you think, uh, it, particularly in our culture today, where there are some very gross sure. incons you know, inconsistencies in people's basic opportunities? So uh, 
my main point is that equal opportunity is just equal outcome in a, at a different point in the, in the spectrum. And the left has identified this a long time ago. The right thought they had some new insight by saying, oh, we're against e equality of outcome, but we're for equality of opportunity. But e e opportunity is a type of outcome. Uh, and you can't achieve equality of opportunity. And it, it just like equality of outcome, achieving equality of opportunity requires hurting some for the benefit of others. It requires redistribution, which, which I'm against. I'm against sacrificing some for the sake of others. I'm against this trade-offs of benefits. And in my view, what I am for is maximizing opportunities. Uh, you know, creating, making it possible for people to have the most opportunities that are feasible. And I think the best system to do that is a free market. It's where the government is not trying to play redistributor and figure out how to do this. And, and you know, it, it, the, the example is, and I don't know if you're going to get to a question on this, but an example of this, you know, where we're really seeing huge, if you will, inequalities is with education. I mean, edu our educational mm -hmm. system is so immoral and so disastrous, it is, it is really horrific. I, I, if you look at public education, uh, the worst schools are in poor neighborhoods and, and poor kids who, who, who don't have, who've already got a bad break in life because of where they're born and, and they don't have money and they, you know, their families might not be as supportive. Then they get sent to the worst schools one can imagine. We spend huge amounts of money on these schools. And they're complete disasters, all in the name of equal, equal opportunity. In my view, what we're doing is destroying their opportunities because giving them a lousy education. I would like to see a world in which we had real innovation, real competition for schooling. I'd like to see pure, uh, the, the entire school system privatized, where this was a market that entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley would go into to try to compete to make money off of poor kids' education. There's amazing opportunities here. And <clears throat> we're destroying those opportunities. They won't even, uh, uh, you, you know, you can't even get school choice, voucher systems, minimal little things, which I think are way too uh, minor to really make an impact. You can't even get that passed because the politics are such that these interest groups are entrenched. And they, it cannot be made, you cannot make the case that this is for the students. None of this is for the students. Here's a statistic. In the inner city of Chicago, it costs the city of Chicago, a uh, school district, by the way, which is technically bankrupt, officially bankrupt. Uh, it costs them $15,000 to, to, to educate one child per year. $15,000. The arch archdiocese, the Catholic schools, in the same inner city, in the same geographic location, cost them $7,500 to educate the same kid. Half price. You could shut down public schools in Chicago, give the money to the archdiocese, and return the, the, the rest to the taxpayers. <laughs> and, and that's without real competition. I'm not even counting Marva Collins, who had a phenomenal school in the inner city in Chicago and charged half what the archdiocese was doing, and every one of her children went to college, and she, again, no selectivity in terms of who entered. If you really bring innovation and competition into schooling, that maximizes opportunity. It doesn't equate them. You can't equate them any more than you can equate outcomes. That, that is a mythology. It's a platonic ideal that cannot be in reality. But what you can do is dramatically improve the opportunities these kids have. Well, Dr. Abbott, there are a number of questions here on this educational yeah. topic. I'd be interested in your perspectives on what uh, needs to be done in you know, making equal, sure. uh, education more equal in this country. And could it be done without government regulation? Well... Uh, first of all, I'd like to, um, to just call attention to the inconsistency in the, in the argument we just heard. Uh, we, it was an argument against government intervention, but it, it all hinges on the idea that the government is giving vouchers, I assume, or some other mechanism to allow poor people to pay for the education that they get to choose in the free market. So it's a, mar it's a reform of government policy, but it's a policy that would still have government very involved in the form of redistribution. Charter reforms, school choice, how, there, are, there are arguments on both sides. I certainly think there are a lot of arguments in favor of it, particularly in poor areas. It's in poor areas where charter schools seem to have the most impact. And one can understand why, because you're starting from a very, very low baseline. But you can't... That's not a private system. A private system is where the government says, bye-bye, you're on your own. No, you want, to have, you want to go to private school? Fine, you pay for it. We don't have any proposals for that. Uh, again, the, 
uh, people on the right who you say are you know, giving, uh, giving up on everything, uh, none of them are proposing that we do that either. And uh, I guess you're not proposing it either. You're proposing that we still have government involved, but we have them involved in a way that allows markets to operate better. And I'm fully in agreement with that. Let's just not call it a lack of government involvement. So let me correct the impression. I was offering, I was offering a transition. <laughs> and this is what happens when I offer a transition, right? Ultimately, absolutely, you want an education, pay for it. The government should have zero redistribution. That is the ultimate. How you get there, I, I, you see, I offer a middle ground and I get nailed for it. <laughs> Can't do it. <laughs> You're listening uh, to the Commonwealth Club of California and our guests are Dr. Yaron Brook, uh, Executive Director of the Ayn Rand Institute and Dr. Alan Auerbach, Professor of Economics at the University of California at Berkeley. We're discussing the importance of income inequality as related to achieving the American dream. I'm Mary Cranston, past chair of the Commonwealth Club Board of Governors and your moderator. You can hear Commonwealth Club programs on the radio and catch up with program videos on the club's uh, YouTube channel. So uh, let's change uh, uh, gears a little bit. There's a number of questions here about the impact of inheritance on wealth distribution in this country and what you think um, the proper role of, of uh, our current laws on, on uh, inheritance are on this question. So Dr. Auerbach, you want to take a first crack at that? Well, inheritance is an important factor uh, in uh, wealth, uh, perpetuation of wealth, just ask Donald Trump. We, uh, <laughs> we know that, uh, we know that uh, large fortunes are, there are not many families that, are, that have large fortunes, but there are large fortunes, and that uh, passing them along does uh, perpetuate in, uh, inequality of wealth. We have a very small and not particularly effective estate tax that now affects about half a percent of decedents. It's much weaker than it was, uh, say, before uh, the um, uh, Bush administration, certainly before the Reagan administration, uh, when the uh, changes began. And uh, frankly, I think that uh, a, a more uh, vibrant estate tax would uh, play a role in helping to address concerns that people have about uh, lack of fairness in society. Because to whatever extent people feel that uh, people who are self-made and have accumulated wealth through their own industriousness and may view that as a, a, a fair outcome, they're probably less sympathetic when it's three or four generations down the line. Now I understand that you create disincentives to be industrious if you tell people they're not gonna leave money, be able to leave money to their heirs. So I'm not, uh, speaking in favor of a confiscatory estate tax. Uh, but I do think that our current estate tax is relatively weak. It it's, has many, many uh, uh, opportunities for tax planning that make it not as effective as it could be. And frankly, I think it's a small price to pay even for those who are subject to it to have a, a, a more harmonious society where people uh, believe that it all works for all of them. Well, I, I mean, I don't think it's a small price to pay for, for the uh, small business owner who has to liquidate his business in order to pay the tax because of the value of the business that he just inherited. But I just think it's unjust. It's a double taxation. The money is being taxed already. Uh, it is the property of the person who, cre who made it. They can choose to give it a charity. They can choose to consume it, which I don't think is necessarily the best economic option. Or they can choose to leave it to their kids. It's none of our... Business, again, there's no collective pie. It's not our decision. It's his decision. And if you create, it's not so much that you create disincentive um, for them to create the wealth. It's, it's you, you create a strong incentive for them to spend it. Uh, hey, if my kids, if the government's going to take it all, I'm going to buy the yacht. I'm going to, I'm going to get as much out of this as I can. Um, and uh, the statistics also show that uh, so many people who inherit wealth lose it. Uh, it's, it's pretty amazing, uh, the percentage of, of uh, kids and grandkids who don't live up to the challenge of wealth and, and land up losing it. Uh, I think more so, again, uh, in the heyday of, uh, of a more capitalist uh, economy. But, but even today, with all the wealth managers and everything else, just look at athletes. It's very easy to, to, to squander away wealth, uh, particularly if you didn't really work hard to, to create it. Uh, and, and children and grandkids who don't deserve the wealth, they lose it very quickly. You know, uh, inheritance is one aspect of it, but there's clearly um, starting to be 
in our culture, I, I believe in some of the things I've read at least, that there is a, an empowered class that has uh, inheritance reinforcing top education, reinforcing good parents, um, highly educated parents who marry each other, and then that's creating an increasing gap between um, the, those that have those benefits and those that don't. And uh, that is a form of inequality. Um, you could argue it is unfair in the sense that people didn't actually always earn their way into or, or uh, achieve their way into the empowered class. And is it calcifying to the point that uh, it does create instability and that government intervention of some sort is necessary to handle it? Dr. Well, Brooke, you want to start sure. and then? Sure. Uh, look, <laughs> we're unequal. Uh, that's a reality. That's metaphysical. There's nothing you can do to make us the same. We're going to be different. And we're going to marry who we want to marry. And, and yes, people tend to marry. Uh, if, if you're very highly educated, you tend to marry somebody who's highly educated. There's something bad about that. Maybe we should have government regulate that too. And, and to, to, bring about, to bring about marriage equality. We need marriage equality after all. So I, I, don't see, I don't see, I don't see way, I know there's this big literature now. There's, I, I just read an article in The Atlantic about total inequality, where they're adding up uh, wealth and income and marriage. They actually bring up the marriage issue and they add a psychological inequality and they, they add all these things up and then there's total inequality. How do we redistribute? I mean, it's just ridiculous. We're different. We're gonna be different. We're always gonna be different. And that's a good thing. We should actually be celebrating that. And look, part of the incentive, as I came to America with nothing, basically. I mean, a good education, a good background, good parents who-, who Good what, good marriage. A, a great marriage. Um, <laughs> And uh, with somebody from a very different, um, you know, uh, very different background, right? First child to ever go to college and uh, from a Thai family. Uh, and so, so very different in that sense. And, you know, one of the incentives to work really hard and to make some money is to be able to give the opportunities to your kids that you choose to give to them. And then you want to say, no, the government feels like you're giving too many opportunities to your kids, so the government's going to take some of your money away from you, so you can't send your kids to the best school you choose to. So somebody else who maybe hasn't worked as hard as I have to create opportunities for his kids, or whatever the reason is, they, they're unlucky or whatever, so that they can, why? Why isn't the money I created to help my kids my money so that I can create my kids? I pay 50% taxes in California today, right? If you add everything up. 50% of my time, of my work, of my effort goes to help other people's kids have a better life. Why? I, I mean, my kids need the money right now. Well, they don't right now, but they needed it a few <laughs> years ago. Dr. Arbor, what would you say about this issue, about the, the calcification of the, uh, you know, the haves and the have-nots and what we need to do about it? Well, it is certainly true that a sort of mating has uh, increased. There's been a lot written about uh, divergences of uh, social measures uh, in d at different parts of the income distribution, marriage, divorce, family formation, everything's like that. Uh, I, you know, I think I worry less about uh, the success at the top coming from a sort of mating than I worry about the failures lower down. I'm, I find it very disturbing the m many uh, pieces of evidence we have just within the last year about increasing mortality of people lower in the income distribution. Mm -hmm. uh, now you can say, well, this is their choice uh, to, to take uh, addictive drugs that kill them or, or to you know, become alcoholics or uh, criminals or other things that, that lead to early death. Uh, and they're just making a choice and this is the outcome. You know, I think that uh, that's that's a you know not a, not a particularly productive way of thinking about the situation, and I don't necessarily want to just take money from successful people and give it to people who are not doing very well. But I think we have to recognize that they aren't doing very well and think about things that we can do other than giving them a ch pat on the back and congratulating them on their opportunity to fail. Well, let's let's take that on really directly then. If you had a magic wand and could just change things, both of you, to open up mobility and opportunity from the lowest uh, income levels in this country, what would be the, the one or two things you would do first? I mean, I would start with uh, getting government out of, the, out of the way of business. I would start with there because I think what, what is really lacking, and I, and I agree, there, there is this, there's this uh, uh, increasing death rate among middle-aged white working class males 
which is really scary. And, and it's, 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 these are the people voting for Donald Trump, and I think to some extent for Bernie Sanders, because they're mad, they're angry, they're frustrated. There's something clearly wrong in the system. And I think part of it is that they don't have good jobs. Part of it is, is they, they're living through a period of economic stagnation. I would like to see this economy grow significantly, and I think this economy can grow significantly. I don't think there are any barriers to growth. I don't agree with economists who say, this is it, the era of growth has ended. There's, there's, a, there's a book out now that is basically arguing that. What we need is to massively, massively deregulate this economy, massively get government out of the economy, and that includes, by the way, the other side of the regulation. If I were a Republican candidate, thank God I'm not, um, <laughs> I would run on a platform that says no more subsidies to business. Business. Start, start there. Start with getting rid of the, of the, of the side of the closure. I would s slash regulations and create a corporate income tax rate. It, ideally, it would be zero. But, but if, it's, if, if zero is, is not political feasible, with no loopholes. So there'd be no reason to lobby, right? You can't get any favors. Just something very simple, very straightforward. And, and I think this economy, I, you know, you try, maybe we're biased because we live in California, and particularly in Silicon Valley. You see the dynamism, you see the entrepreneurship, you see what Americans are capable of doing when they're freed up. And, and it's no accident that technology is one of the least regulated businesses of all. It's where you get the innovation. I'd like to see that expanded to all businesses and, and get this economy really growing. Now, to really address the issue of, 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 of people who are struggling, I think it has to be more than that, because I think there's a psychological element here, which is driven by a philosophical element, which goes back to my educational point. But at least let's get the simple stuff, which I think is economics. Okay. Let's get that done. So that's your solution. Uh, Dr. Arbach, what would be your one or two things with your magic wand to uh, open up opportunity? Well, well first of all, I, uh, well, I think reform of government involvement in the economy has many arguments for it in certain areas, I, I don't think that's going to have an appreciable effect on the economic growth rate. I, I just don't think there's any evidence at all for that. Which is not to say that we should have bad government regulations. It's just saying that one has to be, have, have realistic uh, under, understanding of what can be accomplished. I think we've talked about education reform, and I, I think that's extremely important. The U.S. has a great university system. People come to the U.S. from other countries to study at our universities, to study at the postgraduate level. Uh, that's not happening at the K-12 level. And we've got to think about what we're doing so badly at lower levels of education. We obviously can be good at education because we do it at levels at, at, in higher education and we have to think about ways in which we can make it better. It is going to, it's probably going to cost money. It, whether, whether, it's, whether the additional reforms uh, are accompanied by uh, a lot of additional spending, I think, is, is crucial for the success of these, uh, these approaches. I don't know that it's politically feasible. I mean, a lot of the reforms that whenever one thinks about a reform that's expensive, it, it immediately confronts the limited resources that our government has, given our current commitments for other programs. Uh, but I, th I think something along those lines is probably the, the thing I would put at the very top of the agenda, and I would think emphasize it much more than anything else I can think of. You know, uh, Dr. Berg, you made a, a point about the fact that um, the American wealth in total is, is not, is, uh, that we think of as the group pie is, is actually not the governments or the people Always. as a whole. Yeah. It's an individual's piece of it that adds up. But what would you say to um, Elizabeth Warren's perspective that uh, nobody in this country gets rich on their own? They, uh, th they are working off the back of infrastructure and other uh, investments in the society and in the community by everybody, and that we should think about paying it forward rather than thinking about trying to grab our little piece. Well, I mean, I think she is making a very important philosophical point for her side, and, and this is why President Obama has, has jumped on it. You didn't build that. It was not an accidental speech. This is, this is what they are driving towards. I, I disagree uh, very strongly with that point of view. Of course people help you, right? Bill Gates didn't make $70 billion by himself. There were lots of employees who all got paid. More millionaires were created in Microsoft than any other company. Suppliers, you know, a variety of different people. Everybody got paid. Everybody got paid. In a trade, win-win. Microsoft got better, and the other party got better. Um, infrastructure. Yeah, we got infrastructure. Who paid for that infrastructure? The guys who made a lot of money. I mean, most of tax revenue comes from the very top. 
particularly with regard to infrastructure, right? So they paid for that. They're the ones who paid for it. Yeah, if you had a great teacher, how many of you had a great teacher in, in school who really impacted your life? Mm -hmm. Say thank you. And if you're really wealthy, write her a check. I mean, that's a personal thing that you should do. Uh, how many of you had lousy teachers? You know, <laughs> what are we gonna do? T take money back? <laughs> so, so the point is that yes, we all, we all benefit from other people. That's wonderful. You know, I, I believe, and this is a, a more philosophical point, all of us owe a huge debt to Aristotle, John Locke, Newton, Einstein. We all stand on giants. It's a few giants that made the civilization possible. So what, are we supposed to feel guilty because, because they were so successful? No, the question is, given, given the world that you live in, how do you make your life the best that it can be? How do you take advantage of the opportunities that you have? And how do you maximize your flourishing as a human being? How do you live the happiest, most successful, and maybe most prosperous, if prosperity is important to you, life that you can live? That's what it's about. And are the people important for that? Absolutely, they're important for that. And, and good, and say thank you when somebody does something nice to you. And, and make sure that you engage, not in Donald Trump type deals, which I, I suspect are win-lose deals, but in win-win transactions where both parties are winning, you're better off and the people around you are better off, which I think is how wealth is created at the end of the day, through win-win transactions. I mean, wealth that's honestly made mm -hmm. is made through win-win transactions. Both of you have made uh, passing reference to our uh, current candidates, and I just wondered <laughs> if uh, you'd be willing to share your perspectives on, on their policies and if you think there's anything uh, you could support or anything that you'd like to point out as particularly uh, nefarious. <laughs> Dr. Auerbach. Oh, I'm the lucky one gets to go first <laughs> on this. I think that um, candidates have largely uh, uh, come to understand that proposing, uh, putting realistic policies is boring and doesn't get you, <laughs> and doesn't get you much support. Particularly if you know they're policies that involve trade-offs, because being realistic, if they cost money, the money has to come from somewhere. And so uh, we have policies of various kinds proposed by various candidates that are simply not feasible, leaving aside whether they would be desirable even if they were. So. You know, there, you, one can find nuggets in various places uh, of uh, good ideas, you know, in, in a con context of generally bad, bad ones. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I think in general, the, it's more a matter of signaling, like people will hear a candidate say something and understand that that candidate can't possibly mean what's being said, but they kind of think they know what the candidate really means. And I th I, so I think it's, it's, it's sort of the policies that are being signaled rather than the ones that are really being proposed that one might want to evaluate, but it's very hard to pin down what that might be at this stage. So I think we're going to end on agreement. I mean, <laughs> 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 um, but uh, let, me, let me first say uh, I run a 501c3, so we can't take any political positions. I'm, you know, I can't endorse anybody and da 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 da. -da. But what really scares me is not the candidates. Uh, the candidates are particularly bad, I think, this cycle. It's the American people. It's the response to these candidates. It's the passion that people have engaged in. It's the fact that people are responding to Trump and to Sanders and to what I consider demagogy and, and authoritarianism and, uh, and riling up emotion and an appeal to fear. That I've never seen in America at this level. Of, of an appeal to fear, a, a fear of the other, right? Fear, and this, is, this, was, this has always been authoritarians in Europe have always used this, but I've never really seen in America. We should, all our problems, we're great. America's never made, done anything wrong. We're fine, we just haven't cut good enough deals with, you know, it's because the Chinese are screwing us, the Japanese are screwing us, the Mexicans are screwing us, the Muslims are screwing us. Everybody, everybody, but we're fine, we're great. We've made all the right choices <laughs> other than that. And that whole mentality, which I think Bernie reflects, I think Bernie and, Sa and, and Trump are two sides of the same coin. Um, it really scares me that people respond. Not that there's such a person like Trump that exists. You expect that. But that people respond to that is, is very disappointing and very scary in, in, uh, in a country that I think was much, much better than this in the past. 
Well, unfortunately, we are out of town, time, and that seems like a good, uh, good place to end. Um, I do want to uh, sincerely thank uh, Dr. Yaron Brook, Executive Director of the Ayn Rand Institute and co-author of the new book, <laughs> Equal is Unfair. And Dr. Alan Auerbach, Professor of Economics and Law and Director of the Birch Center of Tax Policy at the University of California. Thank you so much. We also want to thank our audiences here and on radio, television, and the internet. A reminder to everyone um, that uh, Dr. Brooks' book is for sale, and he will be signing copies right outside after the program. And I'm Mary Cranston, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you are in the know, is adjourned. <laughs>